right, and welcome back to the program. You are watching AM Live as we have a look at really what is happening across the country and also from a regional perspective and also global perspective. But we begin here in the country where there was turmoil and chaos and mayhem that reigned across different parts of the country yesterday during the Azimio Manda Mano protests uh, and uh, dubbed... Um, I think, yes, they were actually, uh, uh, you know, protesting what they term as high cost of living and also uh, on the issue of the current regime. Well, uh, Bonamolero, when you're looking at really what um, is happening and from a history of bloody post-election violence really in Kenya, uh, really a lot of eyes are fixated on what is happening here in the country. Do you think this is sort of dented or has any bearing on Kenya as a country from uh, the region, our partners, our neighbors in the continent as well, globally? Yeah, you know, um, uh, I tend to agree mm -hmm. with uh, what uh, my prof there uh, was saying that uh, it appears the end game is let me get into state house and the other one gets out. Mm -hmm. And uh, your question would easily go to what again, uh, I think um, uh, Professor Masharia last week wrote something about uh, the president being popular abroad, but uh, very weak at home. Right. And uh, the coincidence that this was happening at a time when uh, a very serious leader from uh, Iran was visiting the country. I mean, that is an interesting contrast, and it's actually yes, captured and, very well here. And, and you see, Zainab, you see that that gives the uh, international limelight, which is negative. Mm -hmm. And the question we are asking is that uh, uh, do the opposition look at Kenya as uh, an item of William Ruto and Kenya Kwanzaa, but not as a, a house that they also belong to. Mm -hmm. That even if we have quarrels, even in the house, you don't look at the idea of saying, I'll make sure this uh, conflict that is in the house is known by the entire village and the whole uh, county. You handle, you solve issues. But it looks like the approach is not only to dent uh, the president's legitimacy internally, but to also frustrate his international uh, efforts to project Kenya as a regional leader in terms of Pan-Africanism. And uh, obviously, uh, Zainab, it's clear that uh, such demonstrations in Kenya will always attract uh, international uh, uh, concerns and focus, uh, especially that we have uh, in Kenya as they say, if Kenya has a, a small uh, accord, then the entire of Africa will know that there is a crisis in Kenya. We have international media in Kenya here, very much concerned there. We have international organizations in Kenya. Mm -hmm. And therefore, when Kenya is seen that it is taking back, uh, is taking the path of 2008, because already, if you, I was listening to NTV and I saw indications that um, they are now uh, the demonstrations against high cost of uh, living are now metamorphosizing into ethnic dimensions. We are looking at a long uh, Kericho, Kisi, uh, Migori area there, where uh, groups... But doesn't that speak to then, not really ethnically, but really speaking to the fact that these protests, which were only centered in Nairobi, sort of expanding to a wider, you know, base where more people now want to participate and join in this protest because they sort of relate mm. to the issues that are at hand. Yes, they're expanding, but uh, if you look at the undertones, you're right. It's uh, very organized. Uh, the, 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 when you look at the undertones, they go back to the usual. Uh, how do we align to our major political parties? Mm -hmm. It's ethnic alliance. And you'll ask yourself, why is it that people from a certain region are not, uh, even if they are feeling the pain of uh, the cost of living, mm -hmm. are not as bold, are not as invigorated in their demonstrations? 
you cross over, you, so you just see the demarcation is clearly along the uh, politics, mm -hmm. but is also now gaining some uh, ethnic undertones in that case. But then coming back to your international uh, image, right. actually we must start thinking about uh, Kenya as a house for all of us. Whatever happens here, we shouldn't allow it to portray this country in a uh, a different uh, dimension because at the end of the day we are all facing this pain we are all trying to look for a solution and the solution can never be uh, bringing down everything all right yes all right and, and prof just to uh, quickly recap again what was captured on the uh, nation newspaper it says there are two contrasting I images of really what happened yesterday so yesterday you have ashes of chaos yes uh, providing a remarkable commentary of two worlds of a country teetering on the precipice the rule of law and order carried the day and the other were civil disobedience disrupted economies one where the president was unperturbed by the disorder outside the gate to his office and was in fact on a diplomatic foray because we did have the Iran president here in the country. And then on the other side, you have thousands pouring to the streets, burning tires, ejecting passengers from matatus, chanting anti-government slogans. What, what do you make of that? And look, let me quote something that you actually uh, did write in one of your opinion articles in one of the uh, publications. You said... There's a symbiotic relationship between a country's socioeconomic and political health and its standing in the community of nations or ability to act. Then do you think Nairobi has the standing to act as the bigger brother in the region? If, if it had, it's been eroding very fast mm -hmm. um, because it's coming to a point where it is not believable. And uh, if others cannot believe what you are saying, mm -hmm. then you lose power. You lose ability to influence uh, those other people. Mm -hmm. So, yes, there was a time when Nairobi's word was powerful. It is questionable whether that is the case anymore. Um, and what we saw yesterday, the contrast you say, um, organized chaos in different places uh, and uh, the responses that did come and the pictures we had been seeing before mm. about Sudan are very similar. Mm. And, That's how it um, began. Kenya, is, Kenya has been there trying to say it's going to help the Sudanese fix their problems and yet it seems to be having the same problem as the Sudanese. Um, street fighting, chaos, uh, uncontrollable behavior. Uh, so the Kenya standing is not as it should be. Mm. It could be better. And maybe the president and his team need to rethink how they are approaching things because they are not doing very well uh, at present. Where does the um, back stop? Who, who, who should take the first step to either like the, com the, uh, the pictorial calm down or calm down? Who should take that first step? Is it the president or is it the opposition to say, look, uh, we, we, we are not going to go back to the streets. We need to have a conversation uh, with the president. Dialogue, we've tried that before with the bipartisan talks, but that seems to not have, you know, uh, really b b borne any fruits. But then is it the president to say enough is enough? Let me call, uh, you know, Raila Odinga and let's have a conversation Oh, really, what is supposed to happen? What kind of dialogue, what kind of uh, space should we expect to see when it comes to setting down of the you know, fiery uh, you know, sentiments that are already uh, in the air? Ultimately, it is the president. Mm -hmm. It is not Raila Odinga. It is the president who has the constitutional and the moral responsibility mm -hmm to keep peace and order, uh, law and order, or to maintain the peace, uh, it is him. How he does it is his problem. But then that's why he was elected. Mm -hmm. He can decide to enforce the law as he sees it, very forcefully, and that will have its own repercussions. Mm -hmm. He can decide to uh, persuade uh, Raila in one way or another. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, if Raila is persuadable, then that becomes his way. So he can combine the two of them, and, uh, but ultimately it is him. And given that Raila's objective is to <laughs> uh, make him uncomfortable, mm -hmm. then he has to be careful how he goes about it. Mm -hmm. um, now, Raila also may come to a point where he'll be hurting. Right now he's not hurting. Mm -hmm. But there might come a time where he'll be hurting and then he will need to look for a way out also. Uh, initially, I think there was an attempt. Remember when they were talking about creating an office of the official opposition leader, mm -hmm. leader of the opposition, who was to be more powerful than the deputy president, right. according to the Ruto scenario and something. That was a way of cutting a deal. I'm sure they are going to cut a deal sometime. Uh, because the situation cannot go on that way. Mm -hmm. Either the president has to act and act forcibly or cut a deal and could persuade Raila to cut a deal. Because right now, although he has no official powers, Raila is very powerful. He is determining things that will happen in the country for good or for bad. But he's the one doing it. And the president is reacting to Raila's agenda. So the issue is whether uh, the president, Ruto, can take the initiative and be the one to set the agenda. Right now, Raila sets the agenda, and he's simply responding. Mm -hmm. And whether that's because he does not get good advice, or he does not listen to advice, or whatever it is, he's not looking good. Right. And it's up to him. Well, I'm a little probably to add on to that as well and also picking up from that issue of really the regional standing uh, because really the political stability in Kenya uh, is also hurting our standing in terms of the kind of peace initiatives that we're also undertaking uh, in different parts of the region, in DRC, in, in, in the South Sudan peace process. When all these things are happening internally, does it have any impact on, on those particular activities that you know, we are chairing uh, the IGAD quartet process in Sudan, for example? Yeah, uh, I think um, actually the, your first part, the, the honors, you know, the, 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 the back stops with the president. Mm -hmm. He is the leader. He is the one to have the magnanimity to bend back. Mm -hmm for the sake of the country. Uh, in this period of five years, uh, the state is in his hands to steer us towards a direction he believes will be good for this country. Mm -hmm. um, Honorable Raila Odinga is just playing his role already as the leader of the opposition, as he is referred to. Mm -hmm. And uh, his work is um, raising aspects, especially the element of uh, poor public participation and poor communication. Mm -hmm. I think uh, uh, the fact that the president came to power uh, through the support of the so-called hustlers, the people on the ground, maybe it has been taken for granted that uh, you are very popular on the ground. This is a Nairobi issue. It's an elitist issue. So you make decrees, uh, focus forward on what you are trying to do. Uh, the people will fall in place. But you realize one thing has come up, uh, in fact two. One is the decentralization of the demonstrations to create a national aspect. Mm -hmm. That everywhere now, at least even in places like uh, Mali and Wote, that we saw violence and tear gas. Mm -hmm. And then number two is the messaging I've been hearing from the demonstrators whenever they are interviewed. They say it's no longer an issue of Baba. Yeah. It's no longer an issue of Raila. It is us ourselves who are feeling this pain. And if that continues to escalate, then it will be uh, 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 the opposition will achieve what they are going for. That it will be a people driven now uh, aspect. It will no longer be a risk the complaints to get to right. state house or right. the rest, but it will be now an issue of the people. Yes, and I mean, I, I wanted to uh, pick up on that. I mean, do you feel like then there would be a risk of then these protests, which are just associated to the opposition, sort of taking a life of its own, detached from, you know, the political elite itself, which is the opposition, and become something bigger, much bigger than what we anticipate? Exactly. Right. Because uh, even if there is some form of convergence, mm -hmm. but you can see, uh, again, there is the rise, revival. Mm -hmm of that nostalgia of the civil society leading. Mm -hmm. 
They look more organized, more peaceful. I've seen that. Most of them are arrested. They tie themselves on the post and the rest. Very, that is the demonstration we expect. Mm -hmm. Not the other one that looks like when the leader of the opposition says the government has hired goons. When you also look at the patterns of people who are on the expressway, you will see that those were organized thugs. Mm -hmm. So are we seeing an entry of organized criminal gangs right. being used to drive a very noble idea of peaceful demonstrations in the um, constitution? But to come to you is that actually that is th exactly the idea is it may reach somewhere where even the opposition itself will not be in control. Mm. They may even regret that it will be now people driven will not... People will no longer be interested in whether it is Kenya Kwanzaa zone or it is a Azimio zone. Right. The way the messaging is going among the young people that it is no longer about Raila, we are suffering ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, the demonstrations, if the government right. does not strategically come in, I hope the government has all the uh, instruments to get information, to listen to the political barometer on the ground about the people that they want and therefore respond. Otherwise, if they put the plug in the ears and say that we are <coughs> focused on telling people what they want, mm -hmm. we know what they need, then this demonstration, as you have observed, right. is going to take a life of its own that will be uh, beyond the control of the political class. Right. They are playing politics, both sides. But the Kenyans are not seeing that perspective. Mm. The Kenyans are slowly entering into their mind that this thing is affecting us because of the political class. It is now about themselves. Right. And, and, and Prof, even as we wind up on uh, uh, what is happening here in the country very quickly, still on the same issue, do you feel to some extent there's a risk that, you know, this manda mano, the protests that we're seeing, uh, this is, yesterday was a qu quite a bit different because these were pockets of, you know, protests happening across different parts of the country, is going to generate into something much bigger than what we just think of as a political driven agenda well there is a possibility of a revolution in the making mm -hmm. and revolutions tend to have momentums of their own mm -hmm. and sometimes they even eat the revolutionaries mm -hmm. uh, when they become irrelevant right. uh, to the extent of the movement so First, we may have be having some sort of a coup in the making because when you remove a legitimate government by way or one way or another, mm -hmm. uh, then that is a coup. But then that's not the end of the matter because the evolution and the, rap uh, the rapid changes that are likely to come and you end up having people who are in the lead uh, becoming victim of the very revolution that they are advocating. Mm -hmm. Because it's very hard to control the revolution mm -hmm. um, once they gain momentum. So there is that danger of a revolution taking place. Mm -hmm. And there are people who are real gung-ho, they really want a revolution. Mm -hmm. and if you listen to some of them, they want a revolution. Right. And so all the laws and all the uh, procedures and uh, whatever it is, those are just um, by the way, uh, uh, obstacles to the objective of having a revolution. Indeed. So we should, we, I think we, it's multifaceted and anything can happen if it is not properly um, examined. Mm. Uh, President Ruto is the one in charge. He has a whole team of advisors. He has a National Security Council. He has the police. He has what? He has everything. But he does not seem to be using it very well. Because unless he does something, we have the making of a revolution uh, in the process going on. Mm -hmm. And you can never tell what will happen in a revolution. All right. And uh, speaking of uh, revolution, it's really what pushed the people of Sudan to go to the streets uh, when they wanted uh, the ouster of Omar al-Bashir from the presidential seat for three decades he had uh, managed to be the president and then what we see now is a power struggle between two army chiefs which is the sudan army chief abdel fatal burhan and his former deputy deputy mohammed daglo also known as emeti who is the commander of the paramilitary uh, forces that's the rapid support forces and uh, it is 
a war that began sort of in April, the mid of April this year, it has generated into something much bigger. Uh, thousands have been killed and millions have been displaced. And uh, that is another crisis that we're witnessing in, uh, in the region as well. Now, Sudan's government on Monday, which is the army itself, refused uh, to join a regional meeting aimed at ending nearly three months of that brutal fighting, accusing Kenya, uh, which chairs the talks of favoring the uh, rival paramilitaries. Now, neither Burhan nor Daglo uh, personally attended the talks in Addis Ababa, although the RSF sent a representative to the quartet meeting led by Kenya, South Sudan, Djibouti and Ethiopia. Now, Sudan's foreign ministry said its delegation would not participate until its request to remove Kenya as the chair of the talks was met. Now, Buona uh, Muliro, when you're looking at the development so far, I want to get your thoughts on why you think uh, Sudan has taken a stance against Kenya chairing the quartet of, you know, IGAD, uh, you know, the IGAD uh, committee that is supposed to go and help the peace process in Sudan. Where do you think the problem lies here? Yeah, the, the Sudan issue, I think uh, uh, whoever is in Sudan might also be happy they as you say mm -hmm. they looking at the instances in kenya and thinking of how we can exploit that and weaken the entry of brutal whom they do not want the president of kenya to chair but the sudan issue raises a uh, very serious um, uh, fundamental aspects like uh, around three mm -hmm. the crisis there that it is a lesson to all of us and it is linked to the drc uh, issue Mm. That one is the crisis of consent, the crisis of acceptance. You know, they call it the, the, that before you intervene, mm. you must have consent from the government that is there. Mm -hmm. So we are looking at this, uh, the uh, uh, Bruhan, in his heart of hearts, he believes, which is right, that he is the legitimate government. And therefore, when you talk of Sudan, talk about him as the leader of a sovereign state and is the one who should give consent and that's why he say if you send the east africa standby force we will treat them as aggressors because we have not given consent and then number two is the apart from the crisis of consent is the challenge of geopolitics in peace missions i think we have uh, been having this normative or this uh, ethical view that uh, people will love people who come for mediation and peace. And therefore you go there uh, blind of the geopolitics, the interests of the states with, around, within the region and outside. So when you, you look at uh, the Sudan issue, it appears like Kenya would have done some form of uh, uh, conflict sensitivity analysis to know who are the regional actors and the external actors interested in this conflict. Mm -hmm. And who is allied to the who in this case? Look, Kenya looks like it is an honest arbiter, mm -hmm. but it doesn't go in that manner. In the sense that there are those people who believe that they must drive uh, the Sudan peace process and therefore benefit from the outcome. For instance, when you look at the issue of uh, which is not being touched, but uh, the, uh, the presence and the statement of Ethiopia confirms it. Mm -hmm. when they were at IGAD. The issue of um, Great uh, Ethiopia Renaissance Dam. Right. That one explains why Bruhan is insisting on e Egypt. You know, Egypt uh, and, and, and Sudan they have been on, on one side. page right. on issue of the Nile. Right. And Ethiopia and the others on the other side mm -hmm. there. And you can see Bruhan has said that uh, for him, uh, he will only accept mediation from the neighbors that is charred and led by Egypt. And then another dimension comes in from their statement, mm -hmm. the Arab factor. Mm -hmm. The Arab factor. And they actually referred to the Arab state of Egypt. Mm -hmm. But that is not the major Arab factor. The major Arab factor is Saudi Arabia and UAE. Mm -hmm. That the two, when you look at them, they look at Egypt as a bridge to Africa and also whoever controls that zone will be the, um, the hegemony or the power within the Middle East. And it is clear. You will see that on one side, UAE uh, together with um, 
uh, Wagner to some level support RSF. And then on the other side, Saudi Arabia, Egypt axis is for the for Bruhan in that case. So those are the complex issues that Kenya has found itself in. So there's a it much a dilemma. bigger geopolitical dynamic that is playing where, you know, Kenya finds itself at the forefront of trying to initiate this post process in Sudan. But really, there's a bigger web, you know, a, a complex bi bigger web that a, really is playing out. Yes, there's a complex the big web that is playing around. Right nowadays affecting peace missions it never used to be a factor right and then the uh, i would say that the last one that is bringing that there mm -hmm. i would say that uh, just going back to the crisis of consent acceptance right. of the mediator my view is that uh, maybe this is a time that we can save first president ruto can recluse himself uh, in a very uh, honorable manner and we ha we still have an entry point mm -hmm strategically because we must be at the table that transforms uh, sudan's uh, peace process strategically we have our person there south sudan uh, can be our mouthpiece behind there uh, u.s has done that that it, it wants to push it, it its interest in drc but because it knows that if it brings out its neck mm -hmm. u.s is hated and will be seen like an imperialist then you have your own uh, accepted uh, teams right. which can now push your agenda inside there. And we may have uh, South Sudan, other than okay. insisting uh, to move ahead. But I'll just to conclude, I'll mention that uh, the idea to have the East African standby force is, is noble. Mm -hmm. We have been waiting for a long time that uh, even Sudan is a member of the the, 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 it used to be the East, East Africa Brigade. Mm -hmm. So we have been waiting for a long time that we have a standby force that has trained for a long time. Why are states deploying as individual states? And by doing that, they come in with their own interests. Mm -hmm. Why can't we use multilateralism and the East Africa standby force? But uh, Bruhan, who believes that he is um, a leader of is the legitimate government, mm -hmm is still again against that. So the question we are asking is that within this geopolitics, is there another power that is also emboldening mm -hmm. uh, Bruhan's resistance to regional uh, uh, peace missions, the right. IGAD? Mm -hmm. And you'll find that all those pointers I've given you, and we will wait and see mm -hmm. uh, the Egypt-led uh, mission, given that Egypt and Ethiopia. We will wait to see whether Egypt, Ethiopia will converge their interests for the sake of Sudan. All right. Let me get to you, Prof, as well, an overview of some of the developments in uh, Sudan so far when it comes to the war there. And by the way, I know that Egypt is expected to host a summit today yeah. uh, with the same, in, in, including, uh, you know, the military and civil, uh, civilian groups from Sudan, as well as the uh, country's neighbors. So we'll yeah. be getting Chad included, right? So, Prof, just give us a glimpse of really what do you feel the situation uh, is in Sudan when it comes to, first of all, the diplomatic missions that have failed to sort of bring some sort of sense into these two leaders? Um, thank you. Um, well, one, I think we need to note the way revolutions go, the Sudanese upheaval was a civil society thing. Mm -hmm. But the people who are propelling it did not seem to know what to do once they succeed. Mm -hmm. And that's how the military came in because the, the civil society plotters were really clueless as to what they, they do once they get, uh, they get Bashir uh, in trouble. That's one thing. On the question of um, Kenya, I think Kenya made mistakes, serious okay. mistakes, uh, of uh, uh, discarding its uh, uh, capital, diplomatic capital. Uh, when you have ministers uh, saying you go and invade another country uh, and then expect that country to be, feel, to feel good about it, right. there's something wrong with that kind of logic. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the Sudanese, the Khartoum reaction to Kenya's uh, involvement could be understandable in that sense that mm -hmm. uh, we made the wrong uh, statement mm -hmm. uh, which uh, questioned uh, our sincerity. Mm -hmm. uh, we are sincere, but they did not see it that way. Mm -hmm. Now, the other players that are there, the Egyptians, 
to have a very big stake. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are having a meeting today. Uh, one, we hope that the turnout would be better than uh, the turnout in Addis Ababa, where the, the heads of the presidents and did not show up. Mm -hmm. like send some uh, junior people to represent them right. in the whole thing and, and the Sudanese just walked out and said they, there's nothing to talk about so as um, Doc was pointing out earlier that uh, before you go in or some place there should be a level of acceptability mm -hmm. that uh, you are doing the right thing you are the right person to do it and uh, that has not been demonstrated mm -hmm. uh, by Egan mm -hmm. We, All right. we hope that, that um, <laughs> uh, Egypt will probably, we don't know whether they, they, they will accept, mm -hmm. but the level of acceptability. All right. Then there is the concept of uh, the peacekeepers, because when so now things are getting to a point where we have to, somebody has to intervene, mm -hmm. and the question is who, and to go and intervene and do what. Mm -hmm. uh, there's always uh, that issue of um, uh, peacekeepers, sometimes mm -hmm. sent by the UN or whoever it is, and they go there against the wishes of the peace kept, mm -hmm. or the people who are going to be kept uh, peaceably, mm -hmm. do not agree to be kept. So you have, uh, that's why we've had some missions, UN missions and others, uh, failing because they are not acceptable in the place they are. So right. it's, a, it's a very complex issue as to what should be done. But right. Sudan itself is a disaster, is a sad development that affects the entire region uh, in, the, you know, in the whole area. Mm -hmm. And um, the chaos that goes on in Sudan, it is likely to affect South Sudan, mm -hmm. uh, where Kenya had a role in creating. Correct. Uh, it's likely to affect uh, Ethiopia, mm -hmm. and directly then it will affect Kenya. So it, Kenya cannot stay out of this, mm -hmm. but it has to be careful how it goes about it. Mm -hmm. Maybe talk less and do more quietly. But, but you know, Prof, it wasn't Kenya's decision to chair the quartet in this peace process. It was IGAD's decision to put Kenya at the forefront of these negotiations. Then that's why you should question IGAD. It's not thinking properly. But who because else? Not, who else would have been best thinking, positioned then to lead this? No, the, 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 that's what I'm saying. Question eager itself. Mm -hmm. Does it have capacity to see things clearly? Mm -hmm. Of course, there's nothing wrong with Kenya being asked to lead. It's a good thing, right? For Kenya, a good thing. But is it realistic? Knowing what had happened, the position that Kenya had taken that showed it not to be uh, very good to the Sudanese, and they reacted. So for IGAD, which maybe requires or should have mm -hmm. a proper thinking organ, and uh, to tell them, look, you are going to make a mistake here. Don't do that. Do they don't have that. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they should not have done that. Because with, the, with an institution that has good machinery, good system, to think through issues mm -hmm. before taking a position, then this will not have happened. Because it's an embarrassment to the IGAD itself. All right. Not just to people. So the IGAD needs to be questioned as an organization. All right. How it makes decisions. All right. And we have to take a break, but no, very quickly before we do that. Just to add to your observation, uh, uh, almost very frustrating that uh, a regional organization has selected you to lead, it's not your making, and then one of the, uh, the people you want to help uh, rejects you and it turns out to be like it is you who is pushing yourself to, to lead. That's the dilemma of Kenya. But uh, if you look at the assemblage of the, t the states that were around the table to discuss the Sudan issue, uh, look at South Sudan, they have their own internal uh, fragility, uh, Somalia was also considered. You look at even Egypt. Egypt itself has its own internal fragility. And uh, the second issue is that Kenya, apart from being the most stable at that time, is one of the uh, perceived neutral because it doesn't share uh, a border with the, 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 the Sudan part there, unlike the others, including uh, Ethiopia and the rest there. So it was 
automatically the right choice for any regional uh, approach. And we should also keep it in mind that uh, um, it is only one part of the conflicting parties that has raised this. And that's why I insist on the crisis of consent. Do we need to review the idea of who gives consent? Because it was also raised during uh, uh, the issue of uh, uh, Ukraine and, uh, and Russia. That Russia said I was invited by the government in place. But the government, the, the leader was in exile. But he said Russia come in. So the same is happening with uh, Sudan. One of the group that says it is a leader is in a, a crisis. And it is one saying, no, I'm the one to give you consent. So therefore, that is the dilemma Kenya is facing. Yes. Take a very short break here. When we come back, we'll continue with this conversation. The hashtag, as always, is AM Live at NTV at NTV Kenya at Zainab Ismail. Talk to us. We'll be back in a short while as we take a look at really the impact of this crisis, especially on Chad, by the way. Millions have shifted to that side of the country. The refugee crisis there is really troubling. We'll be back. of lavender and the world of freshness. Wash your clothes with Toss Lavender to leave your clothes with a lasting, irresistible freshness. Bluebird peanut butter made with 100% pure peanuts and a good source of omega-6. Grow healthy and happy kids with Bluebird peanut butter. Available in 200 grams, 400 grams and 800 grams. Buy a pack today. Two out of the three girls or three women, let's say, are not privy to sanitary napkin or sanitary pad, which is a very, very essential product, you know. But this is a basic product which should be made available to each and every girl and each and every woman. The issue is affordability. Due to the lack of uh, sanitary pads to the girls, especially in the school time, they are not able to go to the school while they are in their menstrual period. You know? This results into some kind of, uh, uh, some girls getting dropped out from the school. So once they are dropped out, it's early marriage and all those you know problems they, which are, and they're not getting employment because they're not educated. Every stakeholder should contribute his best. But with this wonderful event you're doing, let's kickstart this campaign. You want to have dinner tonight? We need to talk. Dennis, I think we've talked enough about everything we need to. So go and have a lovely dinner with your loving wife. Are you sure this is the right decision? I'm not. Dennis, please. You should stop teasing me. Just go. You think I don't have it in me to achieve my ambition? I know you want to do it, not because you want to help your country and its people, but to get power and money. And to mm -hmm. exact your revenge on people. But do you have to insult me like that? You asked me what I really thought, so that's just how I see it. If we get a divorce now, we'll both get a second chance at happiness and maybe find true love. I have to be honest though, I'm falling in love with Yana. On this episode of The Money. Olakira Mara Holmes, what exactly is it that we're working with here? I, I, I hang out with another doctor here and I keep on asking all the names of Masai. Then he told me about the stars they are called Orakira. I'm like, hey, Orakira is a beautiful name. Then I say, I'm building a new brand in hospitality. Orakira Mara Holmes. We are also planning to go in the global market okay. where um, we will be able to actually show people the, how they can actually live, mm -hmm. work adventure, and have their privacy and exclusivity. This and more on Saturday at 5.30 p.m. The Money, showcasing resilience and exploring scalability.
All right, welcome back to the program as we take a look at uh, what's happening across the region and especially the conflicts that are surrounding some of the states are not just in the East African part of the country of the continent, but also across other parts of the continent as well. But our focus this morning is on the Sudan war and the impact thereafter. And of course, really what it, what it means if that war prolongs, does that have any impact? Uh, and will that impact really have any effect on us as a country as well? But uh, uh, Prof, even as you come in as well, look, we have about 1.4 million people who have so far fled the capital, that is Khartoum, uh, to nearby cities and also nearby cities according to the United Nations. And this, uh, in fact, this means actually people are bearing the biggest brunt uh, of this particular war. And then now you have another ethnic conflict that is flaring up uh, in the west of Darfur. If you can remember, it is one of the worst wars that we did see uh, in Darfur back in the early 2000s. So now that is happening. Would this then mean uh, that, you know, and this is going to be worse for Sudan? First of all, you're facing this crisis in uh, Khartoum and the cities around it. And then now you have an ethnic war that is erupting or reigniting in the west of Darfur, uh, and, and, and conflict that really never ended. It has always been there, a silent one. Uh, what does that mean uh, for Sudan itself and, and, and the countries around it? There is a danger that Sudan might be fragmented. Mm -hmm. uh, Darfur, in fact, the two generals who are quarreling used to operate in in Drafoa's Janja, in Janja Wheat. Right. Uh, so the, they know each other. So the development of Drafoa is very uh, sad and it has the potential of uh, uh, creating divisions, more divisions than there should be. Mm -hmm. There are also supposed to be some movements in Kodafan area mm -hmm. that are not very pleasant, that might lead to more demand for fragmenting Sudan as an entity such that it does not stay strong and uh, continue to stand on its own. So there is that very possibility that um, the move towards fragmentation might be increased and that may not be very good for the, for the region. Mm -hmm. and the millions of people who are affected, and there are millions, uh, getting their lives together back would be very difficult. So actually you have in our eyes, before our eyes, we can see a process of underdevelopment is taking place, and uh, the, how to stop that is a difficult thing. Mm -hmm. So there is danger of Sudan itself being split into big uh, entities right. compared to other countries because it's such a huge country. It can be broken into two or three parts, right. and each of them will look big. Mm -hmm. So that's the danger that we are facing. Or, and, and, uh, and even right, and even as you add on to that, I mean, there's then the issue of the refugee crisis as well that is happening uh, here. More than 180,000 people, according to the UN, have fled to the neighboring Chad. Remember, Chad being one of the poorest countries in the world, really doesn't have the infrastructure to deal with the refugee crisis. I was trying to get the numbers of the people who have also fled uh, to. Uh, that is South in Sudan. to Egypt, by the way, South Sudan. We have the numbers in Egypt. I have the numbers. We have about 256,000 uh, Sudanese refugees have entered Egypt since mid April. So these are countries who are bearing the brunt of you know uh, the refugee crisis really here from this particular war. What impact does this mean uh, and does this have for the countries around it and really? The humanitarian crisis, when you're looking at it, there is no enough aid to cater for all these people. Well, the countries that are receiving the refugees, and I'm sure some of them are going to find themselves in, uh, in Kenya mm -hmm. one of these days, are in dire situation. Right. Because Chad, for instance, really does not have capacity uh, to absorb first of all to feed its own people properly and then uh, to absorb more people mm -hmm. and one of the tragedies that occurs in a refugee situation the host country is the one that suffers the others uh, the international community as it is called the un or whatever mm -hmm. talk about it 
and um, they provide very little assistance. There is some little money that comes in, but they generally talk without giving much assistance to the host country. So the host countries are the ones in trouble. And they therefore have an interest in cooling the temperatures in Sudan so that people can go back home and uh, run their own lives without having to be a burden to the host country. Mm -hmm. The host countries are in, in America. Egypt may be in a better position to deal with it than Chad, mm -hmm. given that it is richer and it's more powerful. It has a few uh, more uh, shillings or whatever the currency is mm -hmm. uh, than Chad. But each, uh, Ethiopia, the same thing, mm -hmm. has the same problem. So the neighboring countries, and even South Sudan, have primary responsibility to try and persuade the two sides to see sense. Mm -hmm. Because somebody has to talk to the two sides and see, please stop this thing. Because if they don't, they are all, the whole region is going to be um, In messed up. Right. In all right. And uh, no, you know, the, the, the whole place will be underdeveloped. It may be in somebody's interest to have the whole place fragmented and continue to be underdeveloped mm -hmm. because then it does not uh, challenge some entrenched interest right. when that happens. All right. Uh, Buona Molero, let's have a look at uh, that particular matter, really, uh, when you're looking at the refugee crisis from your perspective, uh, the impact thereafter. I mean, for the countries uh, that harbor uh, these refugees, it's a terrible situation. Yeah, um, <clears throat> and it makes it more, you know, a complex challenge mm -hmm. for the fact that um, it looks like uh, Sudan was actually uh, the stable anchor of that region, mm -hmm. the Maghreb area. Because uh, as you have observed, Chad, fragile, uh, Egypt, fragile. You go down there, uh, South Sudan, the same. So now we have the anchor itself being weak and generates a, a, a crisis, humanitarian crisis. And that is why uh, I agree with those who have been insisting that uh, we must have some form of intervention, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, because of one, humanitarian crisis and protection of civilians. Because if you look at this, even Eritrea itself, those are, as you have observed, uh, Chad, mm -hmm. very poor, all those are poor states. Mm -hmm. So we are looking at uh, double suffering for mm -hmm. people fleeing the conflict in Sudan and finding themselves in poor states mm. uh, as refugees. Mm. But that is also one of just the elements that are emerging from the regional dimensions of mm. the Sudan conflict, is the idea of um, we will be seeing an increase, just like uh, uh, going up, even I've uh, forgotten to mention, Libya itself right. is fragile, and Libya uh, remains a, concern, a major concern of Egypt than right. coming down here, this side. And so uh, um, the issue of violent extremism and terrorism within the Sahel region uh, we expect that to increase transnational organized crime in this crisis. We may start seeing um, elements of uh, 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 human trafficking as this refugee crisis uh, increases. So the question that you've asked is right, is Chad, is South Sudan, mm. Eritrea, uh, even Egypt itself, given the volume of uh, influx of refugees, mm -hmm. Are they uh, capable of providing sufficient sanctuary for people fleeing from uh, um, a persecution in another country? Mm -hmm. So it is a whole regional crisis if the region continues allowing the two generals mm -hmm. to play politics, uh, allowing them to select who to intervene or who to mediate. Because it is an issue that is not just domiciled in uh, Sudan itself, mm -hmm. is going to explode into regional crisis. Remember Libya, even President Obama himself, when he was asked, when he was retiring and he was asked, uh, what foreign uh, uh, decision do you regret? And he said he regrets the intervention in uh, Libya because it caused an entire region, mm -hmm. Sahel, to be unstable. Right. So this is going to be uh, uh, increased if 
we do not find solutions to the Sudan crisis. Mm -hmm. And I agree that the first uh, priority now, even as the, pol uh, the political process starts, is the humanitarian crisis. Mm -hmm. How do you protect civilians? Because there are already elements of sexual violence against uh, women within that uh, uh, crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, there has already been a report by the human rights uh, experts of the UN concerning that. So uh, I agree with the EGADS uh, communicate that the uh, uh, first priority is we must deploy for the purposes of humanitarian and protection of the civilians. Mm -hmm. And maybe just to add on to that, I mean, I was looking at the numbers here. Uh, the International Organization for Migration latest estimates uh, on Tuesday uh, say that the number of uh, uh, people uprooted, uprooted by the conflict has now surpassed 3 million. Mm -hmm. uh, it also said that more than 2.4 million people have been displaced internally and more than 730,000 have crossed into the neighboring countries now. Uh, it also says the capital Khartoum, which, uh, much of, uh, which has been abandoned and destroyed during the fighting, uh, and Darfur as well, has seen most of the people flee. This is according to the latest report mm -hmm. by the International Organization uh, for Migration on Tuesday. And also looking at the fact that right now we do know that the United Kingdom, by the way, has imposed sanctions on a number of entities linked uh, to the warring factions in Sudan as more people continue uh, to really be affected by that. The British government yesterday uh, announced sanctions on three businesses linked with the Sudanese armed forces and three with the paramilitary rapid support forces stating efforts to pressure warring parties to engage in a peace process and facilitate humanitarian aid. So you have all those entities, uh, you have the defense industries systems and two other entities blacklisted for bank rolling and providing support to the army and its chief commander. The UK is saying the conglomerate finances the general and has more than 200 companies and make an annual profit of $2 billion. So that has a huge impact in terms of the money uh, that is being used used to really fuel uh, the conflict here. For financing and arming the RSF, the UK has sanctioned Al Junaid. It's a conglomerate as well, said to be set up by the paramilitary forces leader, uh, General Mohammed Amdan. Dagalo, along with uh, two other companies, uh, the Foreign Secretary James Cleverly uh, from UK saying, and I quote, these sanctions are directly targeting those whose actions have destroyed the lives of millions. Both sides have committed multiple ceasefire violations in a war, which is completely unjustified. Prof, when you're looking at these sanctions uh, that now are beginning uh, to be placed on these warring factions in Sudan, does it have any impact? Because then it means, perhaps to some extent, the money, the financial resource that is needed really to fuel the ongoing wrangling would have any impact on, 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 on their efforts, on their activities? Well, it's a good gesture. And uh, maybe there should be more of those kind of good gestures. Mm -hmm. As to whether it will have an immediate effect is another matter. Mm -hmm. Because the, the two generals are well resourced up to now. And so they feel that they, they have the ability to continue fighting mm -hmm. until uh, they are exhausted. And uh, it appears as if neither of the two gentlemen or generals uh, is hurting. Mm -hmm. Other people are hurting, but they themselves are not hurting. Right. <coughs> when it comes to the point where they will be hurting, then they may be interested in um, cutting a deal or uh, stopping the whole thing. All right. So as long as they are not hurting, then they are likely to continue. So the question comes up, how do you make them hurt so much that they want to stop it? Because mm -hmm. right now they are not hurting. Other people are hurting, not themselves. And they have resources, the ones they have accumulated for some time. Mm -hmm. So the sanctions, the freezing of assets abroad is a good move. I hope more countries can do that. But I uh, should not expect that it will have a, a solution overnight just because of that. It will take some time. Mm -hmm. And uh, whether eventually it may be necessary, first of all, to negate the existence of uh, Sudanese uh, sovereignty 
in order to uh, intervene mm -hmm. because you have to negate the sovereignty and say it doesn't exist and mm -hmm. then send us uh, necessary troops mm -hmm. to keep the order. That may need to be debated at the United Nations mm -hmm. to see when do you delegitimize a country. And there has been some suggestions of that kind mm -hmm. uh, that might help. Mm -hmm. And, and Mulero, even as we wind up, I just I, I know we're actually out of time <coughs> and we did not mention on what is happening in DRC, but just very quickly, as you know, your final remarks, perhaps you'd also like to add something a final on the Sudan issue. But uh, former President Uhuru Kenyatta, by the way, yesterday uh, reached the Democratic Republic of Congo, that is Goma, to attend the second executive consultative technical meeting. Uh, he is the facilitator of the East African community led Nairobi peace process, uh, who, was, who was received in Goma by the country's Minister of, uh, of State for Regional Integration, Mbusa Nyamwisi. Uh, but also, uh, going back to what is covered on the East African uh, sta uh, newspaper, five things in way of candidate Chisekedi. And of course, this is gearing up to the election that is expected to happen a little bit later on in the year. But he's facing a number of things. A limping economy, skewed mining contracts, Kagame and the war in the East are among issues making DRC leader lose sleep as he gears up for the election in December. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, just to close up the uh, Sudan issue is that uh, it's good for the international community to start weighing in by way of uh, uh, sanctions. Mm -hmm. But then I think they should also weigh in heavily by a way of supporting the IGAD. Mm -hmm. In my own opinion, in my view, is that the IGAD is the best process which I think uh, uh, we should not allow one of the parties to the conflict mm -hmm. to cherry pick, you know, Jeddah process, US process, now you are saying Cairo, mm -hmm. but IGAD is there. If IGAD is supported very well, then we should be able to uh, stabilize uh, Sudan. And I also agree, if this crisis of consent, of acceptance continues, then the UN should be able to say that uh, we do not have a very viable government, mm -hmm. legitimate one, to control whether we enter or not. And then, therefore, we can militarily go in for the sake of the people and humanitarian issues. Mm -hmm. Looking at DRC is almost exactly... Uh, as I've always said, that DRC provided the path that uh, Sudan has followed. Mm -hmm. It suffers the same case of uh, high octane geopolitics, uh, regionally and internationally. But then uh, uh, it also suffers the case of acceptance. Um, uh, Kenya again suffers the idea of a dilemma in, in, in DRC. Uh, former President uh, uh, Uhuru is doing well that mm -hmm. process under a lot of um, uh, high auction uh, geopolitics right. and uh, divisions and resistance from others. Uh, we look at this and you see that um, uh, his friend Shisekedi is more looking at personal survival than the bigger picture of DRC. So in this case, we are looking at if there were no elections, I believe that the, the, the East Africa uh, Regional Force Program or the EAC uh, program would have performed better. But uh, DRC also raises another very uh, complex and emerging issue in peace mm. uh, initiatives is the idea of attaching the process to a state, you know, an individual state being right. the problem. So uh, the question is, uh, uh, the observation is that if ESC did not have uh, maybe Rwanda as a member and as uh, also a consistent person who wants to, a respected member of ESC, perhaps DRC will, be, will have worked well. Because now the whole issue is being attached to states. Right. And that is why Kenya, which the world believed that it is the big boy of the region, mm -hmm. we went in. East Africa, we had our general leading the regional force, and the rest observed. Even Sadak said mm -hmm. EAC maybe is doing well. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, something happened. Maybe we didn't handle that very well, domestic politics and the mm -hmm. rest, because we are leading the peaceful process, the political process, the former president, and then the military diplomacy was being led again by Kenya. Mm -hmm. And therefore, Sadak, I think uh, uh, South Africa and Angola, 
have seen that uh, Kenya is not as big a boy as they thought, and therefore they have come in uh, to take over. And you'll All see right. that the Luanda process looks like uh, it converges with the interests of Shisekedi, right. uh, because it does not have uh, uh, Rwanda in the mix. Uh, it looks like it is making strides. And we, we want to, to hope that uh, uh, President Uhuru as a facilitator will be able to call for coordination of the various processes, All right. converge them, and see whether uh, the milestones that Kenya had made mm -hmm. uh, through the EAC and through the peaceful process, the Nairobi process, will be revived and maybe uh, harnessed. All right. Yes. Okay. And, and just finally, Prof, your quick remarks on uh, uh, the DRC peace process so far. And of course, uh, uh, former President Uhuru Kenyatta's uh, visit there. Just very quickly, just quick developments overview. Well, um, I think it's um, a good attempt by President Uhuru. Uh, he's got something more useful to do uh, as a former president <laughs> than, 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 than uh, uh, tinkering in domestic politics. I think that uh, he should uh, concentrate on uh, bringing peace in, uh, in the Congo uh, mm -hmm. zone because he's generally acceptable. Uh, the, the, um, there are not many grievances, mm -hmm. uh, people objecting to Uhuru's uh, presence. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but Congo is a very complex matter, uh, more complex than Sudan <coughs> actually. Mm -hmm. and given um, from the day of independence in mm -hmm. 1960, yeah. uh, it started there. You know, the, the, the upheaval started immediately. Right. And uh, been about 60 or more years of continuous upheaval. Mm -hmm. And before that, there were about another 70 years of uh, organized chaos by the Belgians. Uh, so it's a chaotic place, mainly because it has a lot of resources that major powers, big powers want. All right. And they, it appears it's not their interest to see that peace prevails in the Congo. Mm -hmm. Because then those uh, conflict entrepreneurs mm -hmm. may not have very much to do. Right. So they, they, they like it that way, that mm -hmm. way, then they can do it. All right. And Prof, I feel like, and, and Bonham, we should now just perhaps next time just put the DRC issue at the table as a whole and dissect uh, the whole thing there and some of the uh, dynamics playing around uh, the peace in uh, and the security situation in DRC on its own. We should be able to give it a whole show uh, perhaps. on it. But thank you so much, uh, Nasongo Mulero, Foreign Policy and uh, Security Specialist from GLOSEPS. Also, Professor Mashari Munene joining us virtually is historian and international relations expert as we try and make sense of uh, some of the things that are happening in the region internally here in Kenya and really uh, externally as well in terms of uh, the neighbors, uh, our neighbors as well in the region and uh, what that means for us as a whole in terms of even the integration of uh, ourselves as a continent. Well, this is where we wrap it up on NTV AM Live. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, let's continue having a conversation, AM Live. NTV at uh, NTV Kenya at Zenabi Smal Badongowe. I'll be back shortly on Your World, and it's all about the World Youth Skills Day 2023. What's it all about? I'll be telling you about it in a moment. Stay with us. Uh, my name is Zenabi Smal.